I was recruiting for four years in Singapore and essentially like the, the three types of BD I'd be looking at was um, existing clients. So how can I work with my clients that I'm already working with, but to get more out of them? Um, and obviously as somebody senior in the business, that could have been like for myself or for my peers across the business or cross selling. Um, so I think that's something that, you know, it's an easy win. It's quick wins. Um, definitely lots of potential there with existing clients, both locally and regionally, if you are working in a larger organization. I don't know if you ever did that, Nick, like leveraging off, you know, overseas clients and things like that before. I think a lot of our, like our work and I'll say my, my experience as well was more around, you know, with, with those existing clients, you said like the cross sell um, between, you know, everybody's always got projects that are upcoming that obviously they need additional support on. Now I solely focused on permanent recruitment. So what a lot of that then offered was, you know, the ability to cross sell ultimately uh, get some commission back from the the lead flip as well but being able to then you know Everybody. focus in on those yeah being able to focus in on those projects and what other impacts was it that you know that were going to be affected was it more hiring finance was it additional tech resource you know what else could we then sell across the business and other services we also had a consulting arm at the time um, for the company that I worked for and actually you know that that was a huge aspect then in terms of looking at those much bigger projects you know I were there other areas that we could assist in that whether it's data migration or you know system migration as well um that that was clearly a huge aspect of it i think it's probably it's probably the one area uh, probably talking from experience but also seeing it firsthand in terms of you know what a lot of recruiters do is okay great you know i've picked up a role i'll fill that role and actually then forgetting that you know that business is probably still looking to grow there's people leaving there's people going off on maternity you know what whatever it may be or yeah. on long-term sick you know, what else can we then leverage out of that relationship to to expand that further and, and ultimately, you know, nail them down as, you know, a consistent client and somebody that's consistently bringing you, you work month on month. Yeah, I agree. It's also like the easiest place to find work, right? So like for juniors, they would instantly go to like existing clients and then forget about the other two parts of the BD, which I would say were like your warmer clients, but also your cold potential clients. And that's definitely where... A lot of our clients, I've said clients a lot there. <laughs> um, from Talent Ticker, like a lot of our clients in Talent Ticker have found more business through that cold um, outreach for companies they didn't necessarily know about, who might be like 10 man bands but have just received, I don't know, 10 million in funding and need to expand without any like TA team or HR team in place. Um, so we've definitely seen a lot of wins there as well. Do you think do you think it's easier to um, go out cold, let's say you're using funding round insights that you've just sort of touched on, or trying to I don't want to put it wrong, I don't want to say like get as much out of one client as possible, but to exha- exhaust more opportunities with an existing client? I think I think there's there's a blend of both. And I think probably, you know, still keeping a good eye on the recruitment market and hearing a lot from clients. There's probably a reliance at the moment that the clients you do have are going to continue to bring you work and actually then expanding that in terms of, you know, looking at new opportunities and what else is out there. Often it's the identification of those, you know, where are those businesses and so forth. I was very much a recruiter across South Wales, mid Wales market, um, but we were quite restricted within that manner. So actually then you can't even within that market you haven't got a true understanding of every single business within that market what's happening what's going on new businesses that are being created but often it's the ability to then look outside of those geographies or demographics that you're versed to working within in your day-to-day you know where are those opportunities what other companies are growing um certainly within that sector and often what we're seeing you know there's companies growing investing raising investment all of the time um but it's being able to find those opportunities even within you know tougher periods recession so forth it's around being able to identify them and actually ultimately you know know who to get hold of and how yeah it's definitely the hardest part is actually knowing who to get hold of so like if it's a warm client you generally have somebody who can go hey nick like who can i speak to about this role it obviously just makes that connection a lot warmer um, or even like, do you mind introducing me to this hiring manager? So that's always going to be easier for any consultant. I think one of the biggest issues as well at the moment is like 
we think about companies all of our clients that we've been working with over the last like 18 months they haven't really needed to be d so then these consultants who either come in in that 18 months or maybe just prior have got such little bd experience they don't really know how to leverage those relationships um and it's hard to know where to start so again having a platform like tt you can literally just go on there find a lead instantly find the contact and then you have something to talk about i think that just connects all the dots and makes life a lot easier reducing that admin time and that research time as well i think the junior i think the junior consultants as well often what is forgotten is you look at any organization it's not just one hiring manager or one decision maker within that business there's obviously there tends to be an over-reliance on that one individual feeding you everything where actually, you know, being able to, you used to call it mushrooming, but, you know, understanding outside of that, that individual you're speaking to who has control over other departments or other department spend, you know, what are they controlling from a team perspective? What are they looking to add? How's their division looking to grow outside of, you know, perhaps the, the clear image that, that the one person you're speaking to has. So then it's around, you know, everybody's got different pain points, different pressures in terms of workload. Um, and actually, obviously, you know, future plans or projects within that business. So it's being able to understand who else is in that organization. And again, ultimately being able to get hold of them and have those discussions. So I was, I was going to ask, if, if you've got a junior um, recruiter coming straight out of university, they've come in week one, at this very moment in time, as we could potentially be approaching a recession, what would be, I guess, the textbook way of upskilling them in, in, in BD? Um, and they're not, you know, additionally, there are no textbooks. What would be your, like, what would be your tips and tricks to get them hit, like, hit the ground running? There's, an, there's many different ways of doing it. I'd probably typically, you'd probably say 90% of recruiters will do the same is to start tracking things like, you know, funding rounds and so forth within businesses. It's a huge focus. Everybody does it. Um, you sit down with a business insider, start scoping that out. And then that would be my BD for the next three months is really focused on those organizations. Um, but where I think a lot of people really fall down with that is anybody can ring a business and say, oh, are you recruiting? I've seen you've got funding. It's about then making yourself more credible within that business. So starting to then have more of an understanding, you know, what are the factors are, are happening within the organization that are going to affect or um, lead to further hiring. So things like, you know, people moving through promotion, you know, does that create a backfill opportunity? Has that business released a new product? Do they need additional support around that? Whether that's first line tech support, whether it's software engineering, you know, are there new partnerships or they got to set up new divisions to manage that from a sales perspective? There's many different things, you know, that are going to implement that. And I think that's often the piece that's really forgotten about or perhaps junior recruiters don't, you know, look outside the box in terms of how that really adds to their conversation. But that, that's certainly a, you know, a huge um, differentiating factor that I say I think is often forgotten. So I guess, I guess what you're saying is in the same way as you wouldn't go up to someone uh, just randomly in a pub, tap them on the shoulder and, you know, Nick talk quit. about, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you know, you, you actually have to have some context behind to actually show that you have a level of understanding about their market, their requirements, what they're going to need from you and, and how you could possibly help rather than just ringing them up and say, got any jobs? Yeah, absolutely. Which is why on Talent Ticket we have a spotlight page as well. So you can literally go back and find out everything that company's been doing for the last 12 months plus. So you can literally have quite a clear overview of what's been going on with them. So again, just building up that credibility straight away. And in terms of um, that, that credibility, then, if you're, if you're a new recruiter um, and you don't know your desk, how are you going to build that knowledge quickly so that you can reduce that time to billing? Which is, I think it's something like, isn't it six to nine months? That's the figure I've heard floating around, six to nine months for average for to bill. Um, so what I would say for any new recruiter coming in, what, to be honest, everyone would always train on candidates first. So you, they'd always be speaking to these candidates, you know, seeing the people in the market to understand, you know, what the term, terminology is, what, you know, they, they do on a day to day. But when it comes to BD, I would say breaking it up into a mixture of like, making sure you're nursing warm clients and then also doing your cold outreach. So 
that would reduce that six to nine months quite quickly if you're speaking to either clients that a, you've already got terms with, you've done one-off business with, you may have had a role but never actually signed terms or had interviews, but you had that relationship. So I would get a rookie literally to come in, bring up a list on your CRM of all companies that you know are slightly warm, plug them straight into Tanitika and start building up those leads so that when you're reaching out, you've already got that history. So like, hey, Mr. Client, we spoke or you spoke to the business 12 months ago. Um, we didn't actually, you know, secure any kind of movement there from a partnership. However, I can see X, Y, Z about you based on these news events that are coming through. Again, building up that credibility. And it just puts you in a position of like, OK, yeah, I've not been doing this a long time, but I've taken my time out to actually really understand your business. Um, and then, yeah, so like that, that's your quick wins. But also you need to be doing that with companies, again, that you don't have that relationship with it. With, so then you're constantly building up that pipeline and looking at that conveyor belt to go, right, I've got this company I'm working with. Perfect. Let's let's keep farming that. Let's keep warming that up. But always putting new ones on, on the conveyor belt because things will drop off. You know, things hopefully will, will go well, but that's not always the case. You know, there could be hiring freezes, redundancies, etc. So just making sure you've got your eggs in lots of different baskets, essentially. I think there's probably a tendency as well, and pretty, you know, speaking from experience, you know, if you're a new recruiter coming in that desk, there are going to be, you know, more experienced people within that office. And actually, you know, you're going to go to ring a company and they're going to say, oh, I won't bother. You know, they really don't like us. You know, this has happened in, within the past. You know, take that as a challenge because, you know, I, the number of people that I've known that, you know, have really taken that bull by the horns, they've ended up building, you know, really long standing relationships that have you know continued to give them business for you know three four five six years worth um after rebuilding that relationship and i think that's often a you know something that really gets forgotten is sometimes a different voice a different approach to to the debt to the recruitment process is often what these clients need um but there's always going to be a scaremonger that uh, that tells you to um to stay well clear i have exactly that story so our old top biller he was like proper classic British recruiter over in Asia, like real geezer. Like my first couple of weeks, I started reaching out to this tier one asset management company. And he was like, oh, don't bother, you'll never get in there. And I was just like, oh, okay. And you know what, you're nervous, you knew. You, I was just like, you know what, I've got nothing to lose. Reached out, they ended up being one of my biggest clients. I think I had an 80K fee and a 90k fee from them within like two years plus other roles in between so like and I always just just feel smug that I used to be like you know what like you, you never know and our old director used to shout at us be like armpit armpit and I was like what's that even mean it was like bas- basically like assumptions will make your pipeline run dry like you just need to make sure that you're you know putting yourself in as many opportunities as possible so yeah you just never know don't make assumptions on clients that you've either never spoken to or never dealt with before and like Nick said, like literally a change of voice could be all it takes. What was the uh, armpit? As in, how did, was that? Uh... Like, it's like armpit, so it's like assumptions run my pipeline, uh, assumptions run my pipeline into trouble. Right. I was, to to, yeah, I was struggling to find a connection between the two. <laughs> um, I'll say again, armpit, used to sh- uh, my old director used to shout like armpit, armpit. And I was like, what on earth? And it's like basically assumptions run my pipeline into trouble. Cool. That's a good one. I've not heard that one before. We should use that one. We should definitely use that. I also <laughs> shouted the guys being like, work the company, not the prospect. So basically, like, one person could say no, but it doesn't mean to say there's not three or four other hiring managers in that team, especially when you're looking at these massive, like, corporates. They have multiple teams, multiple divisions, multiple locations, whatever it might be. I think Nick, you've said the same thing um, with some of your guys, haven't you? Like, especially in August, you can't get through to someone and you try them three or four times. It's like, I can't get through, right on to the next one. And you're like, well, what about those four other people that work in the same sort of area or division that might be in the office? Have you tried them? Um, you know, we literally had a case like this week where I found ten people for one of our guys, like, and, and that's sales. But again, essentially, recruitment is sales. It's the same thing. There's always other people to speak to. Again, it's like not one person's decision or vision of what they need that's not always representative across everybody else there's other strategy meetings that go on there's other conversations and actually being able to buy somebody you know i was like it is the biggest challenge in terms of somebody that says no to actually then turn around and and sign in that agreement a couple of weeks later sometimes that's the biggest win you'll ever have in sales and uh, it's very bittersweet 
Now, Liv, you were you were in Singapore, weren't you? And um, Biff, you were in uh, the UK. So, what what Liv? Did you notice any like major differences when you went from the UK over to Singapore in terms of uh, BD, or was was it very much the same sort of game? Um, I would say in Singapore, it's a lot more relationship driven. Um, it's the only the only difference really is but then I guess it depends on the industry you're recruiting like there'll be some companies over here that want to do everything over team zoom whereas there are others that want to meet you for a coffee um I guess it's just being aware of different cultures that, that's so Singapore thing. it was more face-to-face uh yeah right okay but obviously this is pre-covid so yeah. might have changed a little bit now probably be the opposite I would say a bit more wary over there potentially and what um verticals did you recruit for um, so we focus purely on financial services and I was mainly doing governance, so legal risk compliance roles. So. And I, I guess it's a legal risk and compliance, right? So they um, heavily regulated. So you might see some stories that come on saying X, Y and Z has been fined 100 million for breach of whatever. Yeah. Um, and is that another ripe opportunity for you to touch base and say, look, I've got a perfect head of compliance that will backfill that void for you that's some huge um shoes to step into but means absolutely like huge fee potentially obviously it'd be a big close but um yeah definitely anything like within the regulatory space that could lead to hiring or firing is something you want to know about um because even with firing it could mean that there's some good people who you know have opportunities or need opportunities elsewhere so that's talent you can tap into so i think a lot of people a lot of consultants that I've worked with in the past, they, they try and differentiate the difference between clients and candidates too much, but they're both the same. Like your client could be your candidate and your candidate could be your client. Um, and when you master that, like it makes your life a lot easier because you know, you're just speaking to the same people and everyone has the same interests. They want to know, you know, what's going on, you know, in their peers, in their competitors, but also what opportunities there are for them, whether that be for hiring or for opportunities for them to move into. So they are one in the same. Yeah, you do hear stories of um, recruiters that stick with the same candidate like throughout their career and they place them every two or three years. Yeah. Um, did you did you see much of that or did you have that yourself? Um, I didn't have it myself, but there was a few ca- candidates that I had placed who had my, pre- my boss had placed previously. So that was quite nice. Um, so, yeah, it might just be a case of either using the same person or the same brand, the same company, because they know they've had a good experience with them. They know the interview process was seamless when they've hired through you. Um, and it's trust, isn't it? You know, you, your branding is your trust. And the more going back to being, you know, understanding or um, understanding what's going on with your clients and your candidates, that, that comes down to trust as well. You know what you're talking about. Um, so, so, yeah, it's, yeah, really so, so it's definitely as, it, it's as much of that relationship management that lengthy relationship management rather than how well you can quick sell on the first call yeah absolutely obviously you might have to be a bit hungry to start with and you know you you have to do some things to get that outreach going but from there then it is about you and your brands and your reputation and what you can bring to the table and I guess it, I think um, I've seen pipeline spoken about probably more so in the last few months um, in the if you fill your pipeline with healthy opportunities and rather than taking the quick wins, then you're playing the long game. Um, what what would be your takes on the long game or the quick wins? For me, so I would always with my pipeline, I try and have a mixture of seniorities. So you want two or three juicy roles, 100k fees. I'm I'm talking Singapore dollars now, obviously that's my my background, but you want a few of those so they could drop in maybe one a quarter over the year. Those 100k deals, they they can take nine months. They are like senior senior roles, lots of different interviews. You want a few quick wins that might be like, you know, two rounds higher um, so that you've got those just coming in quick and fast and they can top up then these big deals and obviously get more commission then if you've got a higher higher invoice in that month Um, and then I'd say you want a few mid-level so ones that you know if you close you've hit your monthly target easy so I think a good again it's juggling it's juggling different types of clients whether they be new or old it's juggling different types of roles whether they be junior or senior Um, again I recruited perms so that's my experience I'm sure if you were speaking to somebody doing contract work would be a bit different but you need to have things that can close quickly and you need to have things that can close nice big juicy deals.
Yeah, it's always having a, a blend of the two. You can't be over reliant on one and not the other. You've got to have the two that can work alongside each other. Probably, you know, we're talking good examples at the moment. You know, certainly in the UK side of things is, you know, a recession got announced. Is it now a month and a half ago? It's two months ago. Um, you know, a lot of the companies that would have been planning these much bigger hires um, prior to that will have put projects on hold they would have slowed down recruitment said look we're going to wait wait it out and see the new year that's all it takes um is you know something like that for change and if you're over reliant on your heavy deals then you know there is a there's obviously a big big void to fill um so it's having the blend of both and that's where you can work across you know your multiple clients kind of multiple size opportunities and again looking at those fast growth businesses and they're going to bring in you know a number of opportunities for you over the next six months to some of your larger clients where it's you know one role every every six twelve maybe 18 months but ultimately when they do come in you know you've got a full focus on it but ultimately the the rewards are there as well should you fill it I think when it comes to recessions as well, like there's always companies that are going to do well. So you need to be inquisitive. You need to be educating yourself on what is going on in the market, like in general business to understand, you know, what's the next big trend, who's going to be growing even in a recession, because, you know, yeah, of course there's, there's a lot of negativity, but there's some really good companies out there still doing amazing things. And the demand is definitely still there like right now and will be there for the next six to 12 months as well. Well, yeah, because I was going to say we, we, we've gone from a candidate-led market where there was more candidates than there were jobs to potentially that middle ground where it's sort of aligning again and then it's going to go to there's fewer jobs um, and more candidates. So, you know, does your how do you find those companies that are doing well? Like where, where's the best place to find those companies that are succeeding? I think it Can probably depends or is influenced, yeah, probably influenced as well in terms of, you know, the sector that actually you're recruiting within. You know, if we're probably talking that uh, you're recruiting technology roles and things like that, candidate like, you know, commentary is going to remain probably for some while. And that's purely because there's a huge shortfall in skill set, um, just purely at the pace of which the industry has grown. You know, only in the last, you know, you never heard of banking apps probably 10, 15 years ago, whatever it is now. But actually now, you know, everything's app based and these companies need developers and so forth to do it. There's always going to be that shortfall. Um, and I think now they're actually teaching technology within like key stage one at schools. So obviously starting to void that gap in the future. But, you know, probably for the next five to 10 years, they're still going to remain that void. But obviously there's huge focuses on people reskilling, retraining where perhaps you're looking at industries you know that much let's say have been around longer things like finance that you know I, I recruited in a lot of those you know people are there and already but then it's around you know again looking at those growing the growing and emerging tech markets perhaps so looking at your reg tech businesses fintech insure tech you know people like this where there's huge emerging uh, tech trying to change the way businesses the country you know operates um to speed things up from an efficiency point of view these are the businesses off the back of newly released funding and so forth are really going to start to grow and grow at mass that's where you can start to get some of these quick wins but it's around you know ultimately if i was going back to desk now it's around identifying those emerging markets who's taking an investment you know where are the new trends as liv said within the market you know, and ultimately it's all around efficiency and, and making things faster uh, and bringing it more online. They're the places that really are going to get you getting, still getting the investment during tough periods. And it's about identifying them. And again, you know, out of that, identifying who the hell to call within those organizations, really, to start building those relationships. So we've sort of touched on, um, I guess, the market, you know, we've spoken about recession, um, shift in the market. So if, if you were each to pick, um, I guess, like your top three favorite uh, BD, um, I don't know, behaviors or tips or tricks that you, you literally used to do weekly, every Monday, every Wednesday, every Friday, what, what would they be? And we'll, we'll start with, um, we'll start with Liv. Oh, God. Um, follow up. I would say like you've probably already done so much BD and you're probably not following up enough. Um, I think sales statistics at the moment are like eight no's before a yes. So sending one follow-up email is just not going to cut it, especially when you're in um, an industry that's just got a lot of competition and a lot of white noise. Um, 
I'd say second one is multiple touch points. So don't rely on the phone. Don't rely just on email. Don't rely on LinkedIn, like rely on them all. And, you know, at the same time, sporadically, different times of the day, whatever it might be, but just that consistency. Um, and a little bit uh, probably direct, but don't make it about you. A lot of these recruiters you see like messaging like, I specialize in this, I do this. It's not about you. It's about what you know about them. So make it about them. People are interested in talking about themselves. If you can say like, I've done my research, I know you've done this, I know this has happened and I know you're going to need this person. That's a lot more interesting for them to read and you're instantly going to grab their attention. As you say, the amount of messages that I, I get on LinkedIn, but I never get a call. Or, or an email yeah so then they just yeah they just give up after that that first that first yeah. message my first my fourth bonus point would be to spec a cv spec a candidate obviously with consent but again it it's something that they want to see if it's a skill that they're looking for and they haven't been able to find it they, they're obviously going to want to have a conversation with you so and, and that is whether you know they've got a role or not absolutely yeah because like even like I do the internal recruitment here now or I support um, support it, there's roles that I know are coming up that we haven't advertised or, you know, we might have had a resignation and we, we haven't told the team yet. So I'm already, for example, looking for that particular headcount before it's even on the market. So chasing, chasing adverts just isn't enough. If I had a recruiter that was checking in with me regularly, you know, following, um, following our business and you know looking at my activity on like LinkedIn things like that a little bit more intently they probably pick up on those signs um whereas like those who just wait for an ad and go hi I've seen you've got an advert I've got a CV they just it's just not enough these days this this it's just not good enough if I'm honest and then Nick what about yourself yeah I think you know I suppose this depends from you know, uh, I suppose differs whether you're coming in and completely new into a cold desk or, you know, perhaps been sat in there for a few months. But number one for me, you know, is taking those candidates to market. The amount of candidates you're meeting, speaking to everybody, and it doesn't matter who you speak to, whether it's, I don't know, CEO at Barclays or someone else, everyone has got that perfect opportunity that they want um, and what they would move for. And it's about understanding that from the candidate perspective. And then ultimately, you've got a CRM filled with a book of business. You know, you you know what those opportunities are, where those organizations will be in terms of that hold that opportunity. Ultimately, I say if you're further into the role and you've already built up a relationship with that client, perhaps place somebody with them previously as well. The best question, that, you know, I'd always ask is that if I come across anybody that I consider absolutely A1, you know, the, one of the best people I've met this year, is it worthwhile me giving you a call? Because businesses, they have a fear of missing out on the best talent. And that doesn't matter where you are. If that person is there, they might have a project that's kickstarting in six months from now. If that person is looking right now and move for the opportunity, as a betting man, most most businesses will entertain that conversation. Or they'll certainly meet them for a coffee because, again, they'd rather have that individual within their business rather than, than missing out further down the line. So it does depend on what stage you're, you're at, I say, with your desk in terms of how you approach that. But ultimately, you're going to have more experienced recruiters around you as well that have got existing clients, have that conversation and, and share share the information about that individual internally. It may be that actually they can do some of that legwork for you as well. That would certainly be, you know, number one. As Liv said, the one I'm really against is is more of that advert, you know, tracking and, and uh, chasing. We used to call it ambulance chasing. It's by the time it's released and it's out there, you're too late. Um, that's the ultimate aim. You need to, you need to start getting in there ahead of, of the event actually taking place. Whether it's that individual that that is going to move, whether it's understanding or having a inkling as to whether a funding round is going to take place, or you know, you know, what are they potentially going to be hiring further down the line? That's really where you need to be operating is is ahead of ahead of that actually taking place. But second to that. Um, Again, you know, it doesn't matter. Probably the flip side, I know Liv mentioned it earlier, is, you know, the amount of candidates you speak to, you know, whether that's at a very senior level um, or what, at the end of the day, they're hiring managers as well. And actually asking them around that and flipping those conversations, have them 
have the conversations with them around their personal personal position you know what's that perfect role that you want to look for what what is it that will tempt you to move but ultimately they're managing the team as well so actually you know what flip the conversation what's happening within your division at the moment is there anything i can help support you on there obviously i've given you a good service from a candidate perspective i'm going to do that with all my candidates so you can ensure that you know they're being looked after but perhaps i can help support you on the flip side and that's often something i think um certainly a lot of junior recruiters probably going to be pretty pretty scared of asking um Ultimately, it's only a person. We all have a job to do, um, and they're pretty averse to that. But I think being up front and, and fronting that in terms of, look, i got a job to do as well. You know, how else can I support you? Often that's probably better received as well, as long as you've done them a good service um, on the flip side. Yeah, I like the asking for permission to send a candidate as well. Like, if, if I found a perfect candidate, who would it be? Um, and then you'd be like, oh, literally, you've, like, you, you've given me permission to send this to you. So it's not that big of a deal then if you are marketing a candidate out. So there's a lot of, um, I guess it seems quite fashionable at the minute, doesn't it? This LinkedIn, like building your personal brand, social selling. So do you think that that plays a big part in the modern recruiter's uh, skill set and, and actually making an effort to build that social brand and not just, like you said, in Singapore is very much face to face, but do you think it's a requirement now to build that social brand? I would say this is one of the biggest problems that recruiters are going to have over the next six months is that they haven't been doing that for the last two years because they haven't needed to. Um, so I think that that is going to catch up with a lot of uh, a lot of businesses because they just haven't been spending that time nurturing those relationships. And, and that's where you're going to find you know, very quickly and they're going to be saying, we need tools to help us with BD. It's often the part, I think, where it's that fear. And Jamie, I think you summed it up per- perfectly earlier. It's the fear of picking up the phone at the moment. And I get a lot of that from the conversations I have with the, with recruiters. You know, they're really struggling to change the mindset of their recruiters because typically how it has been, as you said, very candidate light, job heavy, is I'll drop an email. Oh, by the way, I specialize in this. I've worked with these types of clients. I can see you've got a role advertised. You need some support. The simple answer at the moment or the last 18 months has been, yes, please help. We'll sign whatever's needed. That's going to start to change very, very quickly. And actually then what it, what hiring managers are going to want are people that have worked really hard for them. They've built a relationship. Actually, hiring managers got an understanding in terms of how they work and, and you know, utilize their day to day. They're the people that are going to start getting these roles. So perhaps as the, say, less experienced recruiters that haven't had to do this hard BD and have perhaps had the the easy run for a while they're the people that are going to have the biggest shock and this is where it's perhaps looking you know outside of the box um for want of another phrase but it's starting to work around that and start looking at different ways of getting in with these opportunities or certainly you know starting to showcase exactly how you work and who you're looking after you know a massive one that people often forget about is testimonials you know if you've got somebody singing your praises from a client perspective and a candidate Often that's the biggest thing you can you can have because that will put a personal touch um, on your service rather than purely a brand that isn't your brand but a company brand. I think as well you're going to find a lot of um, recruiters are going to have to start working on negotiation skills as well. For example, like again, Nick just hit the nail on the head. I'll sign whatever you want me to sign. They they might have signed 30, 50 percent terms at this point, and actually you're going to have to start, you know, discussing that now because clients are not going to want to pay that anymore. They're not going to need to because they're not going to need the support as much. So, yeah, you might find they, they try and get back down to, I don't know, 12, 15%. So it's going to be a very interesting couple months for sure. So it's a, in as much as recruiters should be um, actively working their, um, their market on the phones, then they should be doing the same on LinkedIn. Is that what we're saying? That they should be actively sharing value, content, engaging with people in exactly the same way as they would do over the phone, but on LinkedIn? Everywhere would be my simple opinion. Start building something where people start to recognize you. So actually, you know, if you're engaging with them on social media, whatever it is, then actually... You know, by the time you come to make that call, they're already kind of aware of who you are, because ultimately, you know, where are we now? September, 
if you're only just starting to think around BD quite now, you're too late. It's as simple as that. You know, you're, you're two months late already. You know, people need to start acting really, really quick and start making a, an impact. Ultimately, if you're going to go down the route of building a social brand, that takes time. It takes a lot of time. Um, but realistically, you need you need additional support in order to, you know, start giving you a competitive advantage, um, start giving you a bit of a, a heads up, uh, I say, of, of stuff or start actually leveraging slash working around the conversations that you're already having to to ultimately get in there ahead of that event or um, taking place. Just my honest opinion, but I feel like LinkedIn is so overly saturated at the moment. Um, I say this and you can cut it out, but um, it, in my opinion, like LinkedIn is becoming like my nan's Facebook. It's just full of drama um, and not necessarily what LinkedIn was intended for. So whilst, yes, you definitely need to have a presence, you definitely need to be connecting with people that way, I think we need to be going a step further. Again, um, you need to be reaching out to them, you need to be you know, connecting with them on a personal level because it's so easy to hide behind LinkedIn and social media. But actually, the hiring manager is not going on there anymore. The time spent on, on social media, I think, is, is coming down. And again, if you're reliant on that as your only source of connection, like Jamie, you just said, you get loads of emails, but uh, sorry, loads of in-mails, but no actual follow-up. Like, again, it's just not cutting you above your competition at all. The amount of people that are utilizing like LinkedIn automation tools and things like that as well. And it's just reaching out to the wrong people. It's all going, you know, and as Liv said, you know, the amount of news on LinkedIn that quite frankly, I really couldn't give a about you know somebody's dogs died or something else like that's that's no good to me it was intended for business purposes it's it's way beyond that now you've got people having slagging arguments people arguing about i don't know culture everything it's you know it's gone way beyond what it was intended for and actually being able to start leveraging you know different routes of you know going around things and ultimately you know i love a pint but take somebody out for a drink, you know, get to meet them personally. They will tell you much, much more within a personal slash non-work environment than if you're going to go to their office and, and meet them there. Um, it's about actually starting to build that that proper relationship and and look at old school methods, if, if you want a better, better word for it, um, rather than, you know, the new trend of I'll send them a message, I'll send them an email, and fingers crossed they'll come back because that's dying out very quickly. I'd like to see out like what the actual response rate is on an in-mail these days. I imagine it's pretty low, but just a little bit off topic. Something to really consider is the length of messages these days as well. Like 90% of people open up their, their emails on their phone now before they even get to work. So when, when I look at an email from any sort of salesperson, if it goes past one page on my phone, I, I cannot be bothered to read it. I've probably not had my coffee by then. It's probably not that relevant. And even if it is, it's just a bit boring. So the way that you're sending information needs to be modern. It needs to be relevant. And again, like I said earlier, it needs to be about them and not about you and what you can offer. I was just thinking that's probably why she's not reading your emails, Nick. They're, uh, they're, too, they're too long. <laughs> yeah, three lines is more than enough. Lucky if you get three words. <laughs> so, Nick, you were talking about those recruiters who, if they haven't been uh, actively working on their BD in the last quarter, let's say, last ro rolling three months, if they haven't and they're realising they should have been, what can, what could they do to try and pull it back? Get on it now and work like a workhorse um, is the simple answer to that. I'd start actually going back through all of the work that I've done for the past two, three months. I'd start looking at, okay, who are the candidates that I met? Have they actually moved roles? You know, who are their hiring managers? Can I start building a relationship with them with the anticipation that person is going to leave if they haven't? But actually start working backwards to essentially start to get ahead of yourself once again. Um, it is probably going to be a hell of a task to do, but I say the biggest you know thing people can do is is start to react now, start looking at those new methods, all the different ways of which I can work and which I can approach um, hiring managers. Again, if I get existing clients, that I can start actually building relationships, uh, you know, within that that business. You know, it really is the time to start acting now, and ultimately start looking at you know potentially other tools, different you know different sources of information that can ultimately, you know, help you get 
back on track with that you know is there other you know opportunity out there where you know i can start working ahead of myself that, that that's ultimately what what people really need to start thinking about i said literally every single conversation i'm having at the moment it's like uh, we need to get our consultants doing more bd how do we do it can you help us well yes we can you know that that's ultimately the question but 90 percent of conversations we used to work off hot lists so like whenever you met a client or a candidate and they were senior or a manager, they'd go into a hot list of people I've met. If you had terms signed with a company, I'd have a term signed HR contacts, term signed hiring manager contacts. So you've got constantly a, a list of people to start calling through. So again, not wasting time with research, but what you can even do with the likes of Talent Ticker as a tool is have all these companies saved in alerts. So again, it's coming straight to you. So you've got leads in your inbox every morning, don't sit there for half hour with your cup of coffee reading LinkedIn and your nan's um, drama posts and things like that. Get straight on it. Call before people, you know, realistically, most people come into the office at what, 8.39. They normally have half hour, 45 minutes to catch up admin. That is like the key time you need to be reaching out. By the time you hit 10, 11, people are in meetings and then they're on lunch. Then they've probably got another meeting. Like that is your key window. Get in get on it, get on the phone, get your messages out. It's just don't avoid it. And I think that's definitely something people do is just procrastinate and just don't get on it quick enough. So sort of in summary, um, ignore your nan, start <laughs> early in the morning. Um, uh, and then from, from Biff is, is really it's roll your sleeves up, start working hard, start start looking for the wins rather than waiting for them to come to you on a, on a platter. I think so work you, smart as well like don't just work hard don't be working 12 hour days for the sake of it but you know actually think about it break your day up right okay morning I'm going to do all new stuff that comes in on talent ticker then I'm going to have an hour of service in my job speaking to candidates whatever it might be get a couple CVs out before lunch get in after lunch reach out reach out to all existing businesses warm clients spend an hour doing that then go back to servicing your jobs like if you're strict with yourself recruitment is not difficult but it's just so easy to get bogged down in the detail. And if you have tools like Talent Ticket, which produce 10 leads every day, that should be more than enough for you to be servicing new and existing businesses. Okay, so yeah, we've covered a lot and then in the last um, 45 minutes or so. So one last question would be just to pick one, like five to 10 word tip um, that you would, as like a leaving, a finishing note to the last 45 minutes, um, what would you say for a, let's, let's call it for an all rounder. So whether they're new or not, what would be your five to 10 word tip for BD? I'd say start thinking around how you can work a little bit smarter, but whilst leveraging the relationships that you have, whether that's internally with other colleagues and start utilizing their network or actually, you know, the clients you've serviced previously, start working around those and like I say whether that's asking for permission to you know send them amazing candidates that you've met um or actually starting to understand what other projects or, or things they've got going on internally in in the near future okay Liv you can have 150 words if you want I'm going to keep it quite simple and just say follow up follow up with existing follow up with new clients follow up with old clients follow up with your colleagues follow up with everything because you've, you've probably done a lot of the work already. You've just not done the right follow-up. Brilliant. Well, cool. Thank you for your time. Um, I'm going to go and uh, I'm going to take that tip <laughs> and I'm going to go and follow up and do some editing. Um, <laughs>